Good afternoon. My name is Mark Langner. Welcome to Revelation chapter 22. This is our last week together for the book of Revelation. Thank you for sticking with me all the way through. If you'll remember more than four months ago when I started this, I actually had COVID when I began the recordings. And uh, today we're here and thank the Lord for getting us all the way through this series. You will be seeing this, of course, on Friday afternoon. I'll try to get the notes to you for this week by Friday evening. I would love for you to have these soon after the series ends. And again, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to share my screen with you and we'll get into this last chapter of the great book of Revelation. I've just enjoyed it so much uh, studying it again with you. And uh, you'll see that this is Revelation chapter 22. Jesus come quickly for me and for you. And that is absolutely what we pray for everyone on this call that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't, please feel free to give me a call here at the church uh, or to email me at mlangner at cpcfamily.org or Mark Allen Langner at yahoo.com. Be happy to answer e either of those email addresses. And you'll see here all of the Revelation rhymes. I hope that you will print this off. I've put it uh, in black and white only for you so that you're able to print it without using any color ink. Uh, some of the other slides, if you want those to be printed, uh, you'll have to use a lot of color because I like to do that from a visual perspective. Uh, but you'll see again, all 22 rhymes. And, and again, it's Jesus come quickly for me and for you. And that is our revelation rhyme for this week. And now you can go ahead and print that out and keep it in your Bible to help you remember all of these great words. Uh, don't forget that Jesus said that you will be blessed if you read this word and keep it, and that has not changed at any point. Remember that this was written to the church, so I pray that you are part of the church. You're, you are saved by the Lord, and again, if you're not, feel free to give me a call. You'll see here an overarching timeline. Now, we are in the church age currently, so if you were looking at this uh, on this screen, you would be in the blue block, if you will. Uh, we are all in the church age, the age of grace, beyond the time of Jesus Christ coming to this earth, dying for us on the cross, for all people on the cross uh, that will uh, come to him for salvation. He died for everyone. And, uh, and then, of course, he rose again, and we are able, because of that, to have eternal life with Jesus, with Jesus Christ, with our Father, with the Holy Spirit, uh, with our God. But one day there will be a time where there will be a tribulation period, then there will be a thousand-year millennial reign, and then all eternity. I've given you some key events to look at here. Obviously, several of these key events circle around the seven-year period known as the tribulation period. There's a reason for that. Obviously, from chapter 6 to chapter 19 in particular, we find that the church is not mentioned. And there are reasons for that, too. And, of course, we've been through all of those different reasons as we've gone through this study. Uh, but you'll see here that this particular period, there's a little bit more emphasis there, and we'll give even more emphasis to that on this particular slide. I hope that uh, you'll remember that uh, Daniel was the one who prophesied first about many of these different things. Obviously, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so many others also prophesied of this particular time period. Jesus himself spoke of it in Matthew 24 and 25. So we're seeing here what will one day come into fulfillment. And I'm going to take you quite quickly through the primary events of the, of the tribulation period. We know that Gog and Magog will happen either right before or immediately after the rapture of the church. That's where we believe that uh, the current day church will be taken into heaven before these events begin, because all of these events, this entire timeline is about the restoration of Israel as well as the punishment of the nations who refuse Jesus Christ. And so 
we know from there that the church won't be here. So we'll be taken right at the beginning of this tribulation period. And again, uh, the, the rapture itself does not begin the tribulation. The beginning of the tribulation, according to Daniel, is when the Antichrist and Israel sign an agreement together. Now, Gog and Magog 1, remember we talked about Gog and Magog 1 and 2. Um, Gog and Magog 2, or excuse me, uh, takes place at the end of the millennial reign. So you won't see it uh, on this particular slide because that's a thousand years after the end of this. But during this timeline, we'll see uh, Russia and Turkey and Iran and Sudan and all these different countries will go against Israel like has happened so, so many times because Satan hates Israel. He hates the church and he hates Israel. And uh, of course, Jesus is of the lineage of Israel and therefore um, Satan hates them with a, with a great passion. But there will come a time where these countries go against Israel. God supernaturally saves them. It takes many, many months for them to even be able to bury the dead. And we know that that is the beginning of uh, either uh, of the time when we should be looking up. So if we're still around and we see this happen, you need to be really looking up because the rapture is about to take place. Now, again, no man knows the day or the hour, but these are signs. Even Jesus gave us signs and seasons of what to look for. This is a particular prophecy that I, again, believe happens right before or right after the, the rapture be, or, the, or the tribulation begins. And then secondly here, we see the seal judgments. Now, at the beginning of the tribulation period, um, we don't know if the judgments will start immediately or just soon after, but we do know that they will start soon. Uh, you'll remember that the Antichrist comes on the scene. He does so through diplomacy. So I tend to put the seal judgments right at the beginning of the tribulation period. Simultaneously, God is going to supernaturally choose 144,000 Jews, and they will uh, eventually come to him for salvation themselves. They will begin a great revival, and the Holy Spirit obviously must be part of this because he is the one who always draws people to Christ, and that includes the Jews. And so these 144,000 will begin this great revival. The Spirit of God is going to be quite evident. He will be drawing people to Jesus Christ even during the tribulation period. We also know that specifically in Jerusalem, there'll be two witnesses. Now, again, we uh, don't know who these are. They're not named. A lot of people believe Moses and Elijah based on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. Others believe Enoch and Elijah, because neither one of them died physically. And so uh, a lot of different beliefs there, but just understand that all of this witnessing, all of this revival is actually happening during a really horrific time period. We know that there will be war and famine and that people will die for, from all types of different ways. And that's part of the seal judgments. And then following the seal judgments, Still in the first half of the tribulation, I believe, you'll see all these different plagues start to happen. And you'll remember that some of these plagues happen only to those um, who, are, uh, who, who refuse Jesus Christ. So if someone is saved during this time, someone becomes a Christian during the tribulation period, there will be some of these plagues that they're spared from. And so uh, the Bible's pretty clear about that. Then you'll remember in the middle of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will show his true colors. At first, he went through diplomacy with Israel. He's going to break his covenant with them. He's going to set himself up on the throne in the temple that has been rebuilt, I believe, during this time. And he's going to proclaim himself to be God. We also know that he is going to apparently die and be raised back to life. We know that also over around this time that the two witnesses will be killed. They, their deaths will be celebrated for three days, and then they'll be raised to life by God and actually ascend into heaven before everyone's eyes. So all of these different things are going on. 
That's all in the first half of the, of the tribulation period. Beginning with the second half of the tribulation period, that will be the time of the Antichrist and the false prophet. The false prophet will compel people, even by force, to accept the mark of the beast. Um, so this will be a mark on the hand or on the forehead. Uh, and once someone takes that mark, then they are eternally doomed. They are eternally dedicating themselves to the enemy of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so that's not an awesome thing. And we pray that people won't do that. But, we, but the Bible says that there will be many, many that do. Uh, we also know that as we move toward the middle of the second half of the Great Tribulation, so perhaps with like a couple of years to go, the bold judgments will start taking place, and they will take place one after another, after another, after another, after another, and these will be horrific, horrific plagues. And then either simultaneous with this or right afterward, uh, Babylon will be destroyed. Now, I believe there will be a physical Babylon that's destroyed, whether that's the physical city of Babylon itself, where it's been rebuilt during this time, or the city of Rome, as some people believe, and even uh, others will say Jerusalem or New York City or, or wherever, we know that there will be a city, an actual city that will be destroyed. I still tend to believe um, in either an actual Babylon, where it is now, or perhaps Rome. Um, I'll bounce back and forth on that, uh, but I I would say right now, I kind of lean toward a literal Babylon at this point. Um, we know also that there will be symbolic Babylon, and you'll remember that that is both the system of religion, false religion. Uh, so anything that is not through Jesus Christ as Lord, that is a false religion. So all, all that will be destroyed all of the uh, immoral and illegal ways that people have made money, so a monetary system will be destroyed. Those things take place. Babylon's destroyed. The people of the earth will weep. These 10 nations uh, will weep, uh, or nation states will weep. They will be uh, so upset over all their earthly goods being destroyed. And then they will amass an army to take on Jesus Christ in the church. It will not be much of a battle. Jesus himself will speak and these armies will be destroyed. Uh, the Bible says that the blood will be up to the, to the bridles of the, of the horses' necks. And again, whether that's figurative or symbolic, we don't know for sure, but we do know that this will be a great defeat for many, many people. The false prophet and the antichrist will be, of course, cast away. And then the millennial kingdom will be established at that point. So that is a very quick synopsis of the tribulation period. I've given you many, many references here from scriptural perspectives. All of the previous notes are, of course, there as well. If you have any questions about any of this, feel free to email me at any time. It's Mark Allen Langner at yahoo.com. Please feel free to uh, email me there or here at the church. Either way is fine, and I'll be happy to help you with that. Before we really get into the scriptures this morning, I want to note some parallels between Revelation 1 and Revelation 22. This is one of my old professors who uh, has this in one of his books, um, but I love what he uh, said here. A genuine prophecy will take place that's mentioned in both Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 22, and then I'll let you read through all the different references, but very quickly, this was addressed to God's bond servants, so that's you and that's me. Uh, that was John uh, who recorded this revelation from Jesus. It was to be read in the churches. We'll come back to that later on today. It comes from God. It comes also from Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, uh, so that both the Father and the Son are present here. You'll remember from uh, also the uh, the scriptures that talk about uh, to hear the spirit, what the spirit is saying. So Jesus himself references the spirit. So you have the entirety of the Godhead here present in one through three in Revelation. Then again, here in chapter 22. So again, a great parallel there. We know the angel that speaks to John. That John is a genuine prophet, promises a blessing to all who obey it. 
Again, the only book in the New Testament that makes that promise, although we are blessed when we read any book of the New Testament or Old Testament too, for that matter. Uh, it warns of judgment to those who reject it. Again, again, this is a book both of grace and of judgment. And the Lord allows all of us the opportunity to come to him. It focuses on Jesus Christ. You'll remember at the beginning, we said this is from Jesus. It is for Jesus. It is about Jesus. The entire revelation is about Jesus. The Alpha and the Omega, so the beginning and the end, and that Christ is coming soon. Again, the more of the study I do on the book of Revelation, and I've taught it a number of times now, the more I recognize this eminence that Jesus himself, now when Jesus says something, the Bible as a whole can be completely and absolutely trusted. But to me, there's like this double pronouncement when Jesus is personally saying something and he said that he is coming soon. And so that soon means suddenly it could happen at any point and, and the, uh, the New Testament scholars all wrote scripture, but from the Holy Spirit with a sense of eminence in mind. And so we see that from beginning to end. So that is one reason I am a pre-tribulation, premillennial guy. So you can, again, have your own view. But I do want to note these two verses, regardless of what your view is about those types of things. Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And then again at the end, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So we have this eternal nature of Jesus Christ. Christ did not come on the scene in Luke 2 or in Matthew 1. Christ came on the scene from eternity. He has always been. He came to this earth physically as a child, as a baby during the gospel days. But he did, he was, he has always, always been God, the father, son, and spirit have lived in complete unity for all eternity. And we always have to keep that in mind. But when we're looking here at the, at revelation, this is about Jesus Christ. It is about the fact that people, all people are judged on whether they know Christ or whether they do not. And our entire eternity is based on that one fact of Jesus. And then we'll go to the scriptures here. So read with me in Revelation chapter 22, verse one. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations, and there will be no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So we'll talk about a lot of this. You'll remember we talked about the light last week. I told you that I believe that the, the light of Genesis 1 before the sun and the moon are created is God himself. We know that the Trinity was absolutely entirely involved. It was at the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit hovered. The Bible tells us Jesus, we know from John chapter one, spoke the world into existence and all things into existence and that nothing has been made that he didn't make. And so we see this Trinitarian doctrine, even at the beginning of Genesis. And I again believe that the light there prior to the sun and the moon was God himself. That's my personal belief. You can, you can believe what you want, but that's what I believe. We also uh, understand here that the river of, of the water of life has a lot of meanings, and I'm giving you four different possibilities. I think it's probably a combination of all of these. Um, but you you remember the of course the rivers in uh, in Genesis and again this is a reestablishment of a Eden like uh, state except this is even greater than Eden itself 
remember uh, the waters of Ezekiel, uh, the living waters that are mentioned in John chapter 4 and John chapter 7, verse 38, where this is talking about the the salvation of Jesus Christ. So this there is a salvation emphasis even here in Revelation right at the end. And then, of course, um, the overpowering presence of the Spirit of God is often uh, talked about in these terms as well. And then I've given you multiple other verses here, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll read this one verse to you. On that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea in summer and winter alike. So this is an eternal stream. And again, this is, this is significant because it's about Jesus Christ. Notice where it's flowing from. It's flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Notice that there is one throne. So we have this equalizing of uh, of the picture of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all equal. They are all one. They uh, subordinate themselves based on role not based on who they are as a person in the Godhead. And so we see that even in this scripture here. And uh, again, just an amazing picture of, of, of our great God. Then we also notice here this tree of life. It reappears in the new city. It bears 12 fruits. Uh, some people believe, and I, I kind of lean this direction myself, that there is one per month for the healing of the nations. The curse is no more. Those who arrive from the millennial kingdom who chose Christ over Satan, who did not go with Satan. So these people, uh, many of whom have been born in the millennial kingdom, they chose Jesus Christ at the end. We know that many will choose Satan, which I just can't fathom, but they will. Um and, uh, and they will be destroyed. But those who live through this, who dedicate themselves to Jesus Christ, will have available healing for all eternity, some scholars believe. Others believe that they will be healed instantaneously once they are made part of the body of Christ and found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Theologians can argue that all day long, but the, but the truth of the matter is that the tree of life is there. It is for healing for all eternity. No one will be, uh, there will be no curse. There will be no death. There will be no sickness. There will be no disease. None of that. There will be no pain. And uh, for many of us, that's a great thing. No more arthritis or anything like that. No more aging. That's a really great place to say hallelujah. You won't look older. Uh, you'll have a new spiritual body. It will be much better than the one we have now. Uh, no matter how great your body is now, it will be completely different as a spiritual body. And so we have all of that to look forward to. And sometimes because of our uncertainty, we don't know what it's going to be like. As people, we're just naturally curious and sometimes even nosy, and we want to know what's next, what's next, what's next, and we want this certainty. The fact of the matter is we can depend on God who said that he is going to prepare a place for us. If Jesus is going to prepare a place, it's better than the place that we're in, and we can always have that assurance no matter how much we love our uh, our wives or our husbands, uh, for you ladies, uh, no matter how much we love our children and our grandchildren and others uh, and our friends and those in our church, no matter how much we love all these people, if they're saved, they're going to be there too. And it will be better there than here. We can't really fathom that or really understand that but we know that from Scripture, we know that from Jesus himself. So we have to trust our Lord that that's the case. And everything we read about here in the last two chapters indicates how much better it's, it truly is going to be. And then note these words. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. Now, we've heard that before uh, from, from, the, uh, from the Lord Jesus. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. That again, that sense of imminence. And these are the words from Jesus. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So again, we have that double proclamation at the beginning and here where if you keep the words of this book, you are blessed. And then notice this, I, John. So John is cementing 
the fact that he is the one that Jesus has given this to. Um, and it's obviously somebody that had to be known in that region or this wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered if he said, I, John, if he was just some guy. I still believe wholeheartedly that this is John the Apostle who walked with Jesus. But I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. This is the third time in the Revelation we've seen John do this because he's overwhelmed at the holiness here at all these great events. And notice what happens again. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book worship God. If if there's any short sentence here that we could take and tell everybody in the world, that's it. Worship God. Only God is deserving of worship. Now, before anybody gets too hard on John here, remember that John is the one that walked with Christ. These are obviously overwhelming events to make John do this. Obviously, the angel is from God, and so he falls to his feet to worship. And and again, he's reminded, you can't do that. It is only God that you worship. Yes, this is awesome. Yes, this is overwhelming, but don't worship me, worship God. And so I love love the whole idea of of this particular verse. Notice again, look, I am coming soon. This sense of imminence is pronounced throughout the Revelation in the New Testament among the early church. It is central to anyone with pre-tribulation, pre-millennial understanding. This is the third search occurrence in the Revelation. Uh, also, in the uh, when Jesus was speaking to the churches, he said two different times, look, I'm coming soon. So he was reminding the church to look up and to wait, to live according to, to this idea that he's coming soon. We saw a parallel to this in Matthew 24 and 25. So don't forget that Jesus is coming soon. You also notice, of course, here that this is the sixth of the seven blessings. You'll see these words again in, in the same chapter in 2214. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. So we're told again to do that. And also, of course, here, uh, our focus is for to worship only God. And again, we've talked about how John was overwhelmed. Um, Anyone could be overwhelmed with an angel showing the events that John has seen all of this. So I'm not real hard on John here other than to say, I love what the angel said. Hey, I'm, I'm like you. I am here to serve God. So worship him again. Just amazing, amazing verses. Then he said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near. Let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. So I'm going to go ahead and continue. I'll come back to that. Look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Here's that last blessing. So that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gate. So obviously the tree of life is central here. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So the idea here is someone who is continually in these um in these sin practices. This is not something where if you lied today that all of a sudden you're going to be part of these things. Now you shouldn't be lying Christians. Um, I shouldn't be lying as a Christian, but what this is talking about are people that continually practice these, these types of things are obviously not allowing the Holy Spirit to control their lives. Many people, many people who practice these things are not saved at all. All people who practice these things are not saved at all. If it's a true practice where that is your lifestyle. And I believe that that's what is being said here. It's notable that Daniel was told to seal the prophecy in the Old Testament. But right here, when we see these words, John is specifically told to reveal 
the prophecy in the New Testament. Um, you'll also uh, notice here that um, that what he's told to reveal is that either you are for God or you ag you are against him. We, we've seen this all the way through. Either people took the mark or they didn't. People are people in the millennial kingdom either went with Christ or they went with Satan. It's the same thing here. So this is not something that is new that Jesus is saying, but it is an absolute reminder that he is the one who is just. He is the one who has the right to judge. And it is, this is a proverb that suggests that you need to choose today whom you're going to serve. You also notice here again that he says, look, I'm coming soon. So there's this imminent uh, understanding. You don't need to postpone choosing whether you're going to serve God or not. And you're not, you don't need to postpone choosing whether you're going to be with Christ or not. You need to make those decisions today. And again, and Jesus himself is reiterating this. So you have John's words at the beginning uh, uh, given to him by Jesus, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And then you have Jesus himself that are, who is reiterating this, if you will, choose whom you're going to serve. Uh, again, there is a direct contrast between those who are saved and those who are lost and there are rewards and punishment associated to these things. And then you have these words, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright, the, the bright morning star. So again, we have this personal pronouncement of Jesus to the churches. We never should ever, ever, ever forget that the revelation was supposed to be given directly to the churches, actual living churches of Asia back at the time of this writing. And I believe to the churches of all time. And I believe every church that is anywhere falls into one of those seven churches and perhaps combination of those seven churches. But Jesus himself says, hey, this is for the church about Israel. Don't forget, and look, you can see it him, where it says it himself, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. I am the, I am the fulfillment of prophecy. I am the one they prophesied about in the Old Testament. I am of the descendants of David. I am the one who came to save Israel. All of these things are within within these statements, I believe. And notice here what the Bible says, both the spirit and the bride say come. So now you have uh, before uh, in this chapter, we saw the father and the son on the same throne. And now you see the spirit and the bride. So you have the, the, the church, this intimacy between God, the son, God, the Holy spirit and the church. And we notice, um, that again, there is this uh, Trinitarian understanding in this scripture. That's all the way through the Revelation. Now, it's all the, also all the way through scriptures. If you're looking, uh, the Holy Spirit will definitely lead you to that understanding. But it is very direct in this particular chapter. And the Bible says this, uh, both the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life freely. So again, all of this about the water of life. And this is a person um, that um, this is anyone who comes to Jesus Christ for grace. It specifically says, let anyone who hears this message that there are certain people who can come get the water of life and other people who can't, I just can't get there. The Bible plainly says here, let anyone who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. It is a free gift of God's salvation. It is the grace of and, and, it is the, and it is the message of our Messiah to come to him. If we don't, there are obvious penalties for that. But if we do, he saves us. We are, 
we are to take every word of this seriously, and we are to come to Jesus where he gives of us to us freely. I testify to everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. That is not anything I want a part of. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life in the holy city, which are written about in this book. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. So Jesus is coming soon. And John reiterates it. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. No, obviously, John has gone on since this time. But he he had this sense of looking for the Lord to come. That's exactly what we should be doing today as the church, looking for the Lord to come offering this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to everyone that we know, telling them about the Lord who wants everyone to come to him. So that's it for this particular series. I'm going to go through some references with you now. There are four pages. We're not going to go through all four pages, so don't worry about that. We are going to talk uh, very quickly about five different references. Um, I promised you I would do this. Now, I'll give you a couple of extras if you want them regarding particular subjects. If you're going to study the worship sections of the Revelation, Dr. Melissa Archer's is the best work I've ever seen on that. If you're going to study the relationship between Genesis and Revelation, Mark Hitchcock's book is, is pretty good with that. Uh, Tim LaHaye's book is good with that. And I touch on that a fair amount in my own dissertation. So that's out there free for you. Uh, if you want to, uh, uh, Melissa Archer's uh, work and my work are both free. Uh, the others will cost you a little bit on Amazon or wherever you buy your uh, books. Um, you'll notice here, there are five different uh, references that I am highlighting. I'll go through very quickly why I'm highlighting each one. Uh, Daniel Aiken's book, I'm highlighting that because it is, it is the most Christ-centric book of all five of my primary references. I used uh, this particular book a lot early on, particularly from the intro through the end of chapter five. And then I kind of dropped off using his as much, but it is a Christ-centric book. If you ever listen to his podcast, they are absolutely excellent. He's the president of Southeastern uh, Baptist Seminary. And again, I highly recommend his book. Uh, you'll see two on this particular page. Um, the uh, Ed Henson book is just excellent. It's probably uh, one of my two primary sources. It is one of my two primary sources. I'll give you the other one in just a moment uh, that's on a different page. Uh, the 21st Century Biblical Commentary Series is an excellent New Testament commentary series. I've just ordered uh, several books to kind of complete my personal set. Um, so uh, again, uh, that entire series is really, really good, but this book is just excellent, it really is. Uh, Mark Hitchcock's book, I like it. Uh, I use it a lot. I, I probably disagree with, uh, with Mark more than I do some of the other uh, uh, authors that I'm mentioning here uh, more often, but his book is still quite excellent, and it's, it has such a wide range about prophecy itself. It's still a very good book to have. Um, it wouldn't be the first one on my list, but it's definitely in my top five that I've used, particularly toward the end here. I really like his his work toward the end of the of the revelation or the tribulation period and into the millennial kingdom. Uh, that is really good. And then uh, Tim LaHaye's Revelation Unveiled is a timeless classic. A lot of people don't like him because he wrote some fiction with Jerry Jenkins and all of that. First of all, I would say that that's actually not the worst series I've ever seen. Um, uh, but his nonfiction book on, on Revelation is still really, really good. A lot of other well-known theologians use it continually, uh, so I still recommend it. Uh, John Christopher Thomas's book, uh, The Two uh, uh, Horizons New Testament Commentary on Revelation specifically, 
is really excellent. It is, uh, it is robust to be sure. It is not the easiest to get through, but it is one of the two most essential to this study of what you've been hearing. So uh, the John Christopher Thomas book and Ed Henson's books were my two primary references all the way through other than scripture itself and, and, and several others. Uh, again, there are four pages of references here. Get whatever you know appeals to you. Uh, but these particular five, I believe, would help you if you're looking for an overall scope of the revelation. And again, if you have specific things you're looking for, some of these other references might be able to help you. I use the uh, Christian Standard Bible throughout this particular series. I highly recommend it. Um, it is the old Holman Bible. It is very. It does a great job with the languages. It is very readable. Uh, it is now my favorite translation uh, by a by a large margin, uh, and have been using it for a couple of years now. So, uh, so I hope that helps you. Thank you so much again for being with me all the way through this for 23 weeks. If you've made it through all of them, congratulations. God bless you. I pray that the Lord will bless you. Uh, I pray that the Lord will forgive me if I've missed or every place that I've missed it uh, with this study and leading you. Um, but uh, I just hope that you've learned. I have learned again as I've gone through this and uh I appreciate uh, you understanding that when we record these things, if we have a misstep or we say something that we can't go back and do an entire recording all over again every single time. I have a couple of times, but I generally don't do that. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for all that you've done. And I love you and appreciate all of you and all your great comments. And we'll see you in the next series. God bless.